So, I've made excuses for, or even actively applauded some of the changes so far, but, uh, this show is starting to push its luck a little, uh, even with me. An almost inconceivably huge thank you to my patrons for making what I do possible, especially the big three, April Mac, Shelby Holtz, and beloved Sulphine. Consider joining their ranks to get access to new exclusive content every month, including episodes of Lost in Adaptation that can't be posted to YouTube for copyright reasons. Hello mortals and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, the YouTube-based review show dedicated to comparing adaptations to their source material to see how loyally they stuck to it. Today we're looking at episode 4 of Percy Jackson and the Olympians on Disney Plus and The Lightning Thief by Rick Ryden. If you're just joining us now, there's the thing to start at the beginning, but the cliff notes are I am your gorgeous guest host Terence. I'm a little nervous because fans of this book have been burned before, but Ryden himself was in charge of writing this series, so expectations are pretty high. Let's talk adaptation. Quite a lot of the events of the book are here, don't get me wrong, they just... They kind of have a different spin on them now. My faith that certain revelations were just a little behind schedule, but would make an appearance pays off. At least part of the previously discussed bad dreams turn up, I'm not hating the abstract Tartarus by the way, and Grover reveals that his OG god Pan is missing, presumed dead by all but the satyrs. Every satyr that's gone on a search for him hasn't come back, but despite this he still wishes to join their efforts. It looks like they were indeed waiting on mentioning him becoming a searcher to drop all the information at once a few chapters later. The gang continuing to head west across America, now by train, and admiring all of the freaky deaky stuff that regular mortals can't see. Annabeth confides in Percy that she's had a pretty rough time with the human half of her family, as her dad married a mortal woman and the family dynamic changed so much she didn't feel welcome anymore so ran away. They visit the Gateway Arch in St. Louis and are attacked in the upper observatory by Echidna, the mother of all monsters, and her pet Chimera that was pretending to be a small dog. Percy fights valiantly, but falls through a newly made hole in the floor to what would have been his doom if his father hadn't intervened to save him using the Missouri River, where the lad is visited by a local spirit with news from his papa. There is stuff to talk about regarding Echidna, but to their credit they really captured the way she creepily maintained a pleasant and polite attitude even while attempting to kill them. They also included Percy's ever-increasing resentment towards the current status quo amongst half-bloods and their parents, specifically the lack of assistance in their lives lives and or deadly situations. Oh, and uh, by the way, Dom asked me to mention that there are a few beautiful Watcher enamel pins still in stock, just in case anyone's ever wanted to advertise their status as a beautiful Watcher via a small fashion accessory. Divergence from the book begins a lot sooner this time, as Echidna and her pet Chimera pop up way sooner than expected to frame the kids for a crime before attacking them on the train. Well, I suppose egg on my face claiming that Annabeth being black couldn't possibly affect the story. In my defense, in the book they don't come face to face with the American police force like what happened here. Originally, Percy didn't take the stinger jab to the arm until moments before he fell from the arch, making its poison only a very brief inconvenience that quickly became secondary to plummeting 630 feet to the ground. Now it's a continuous issue that gets steadily worse throughout the episode and inspires some wacky attempts to cure it. In the book, the gang stop by the Gateway Arch simply because Annabeth is such a huge architecture nerd. It's actually a nice little character building moment for all three of them, what with them being willing to take a moment out of a fate of the world level quest for a small moment of joy for her. In the show, apparently the arch is a monument to Athena, even if the mortals who built it weren't fully aware of it, so somewhere that Echidna shouldn't have been able to follow them. They still included Annabeth reeling off arch facts, but I don't know, it just feels a little out of place now in the lull between monster attacks. Gods damn it, Percy is still conducting all of his battles and near-death experiences in awkward silence. It's officially off book now, by the way. Hashtag let Percy scream. Wait, no, hang on. That's, that's, that sounds far too malevolent. It's like a slogan that Mrs. Dodds would come up with. His commitment to remaining quiet at all times also resulted in a small but important line being omitted from the show that occurred right before Percy lost his fight to gravity. Father, help me. I, I don't want to sound like I'm fansplaining the book to the guy who fucking wrote it, but I thought that was one of the big plot points of this section, you know? 
Percy learning to put his resentment for his dad aside and ask for help? Is, is Disney Percy just too cool for that little life lesson? Amusingly, the show had to compensate for something that I, a handsome Englishman who's never been to St. Louis, had not considered before now. That despite Book Percy falling right into it, the Gateway Arch does not stretch over the Missouri River, nor is it within jumping range of it even from the top, forcing Poseidon's help to now take the form of a big water tentacle that presumably grabs the lad out of the air. So, we come at last to the subject of the thumbnail clickbait. My goodness, Athena's done a little dirty here, isn't she? If she were my mother, I would be pissed as hell. So, apparently, the goddess of doing war intelligently was so embarrassed by Percy's head delivery, she actively assists in the demise of her own daughter by allowing the mother of monsters into her sanctuary to kill her. The cold-heartedness of this aside, considering what's at stake on this quest, one could describe this as somewhat unwise or bloody stupid if you're not trying to be coy. Zeus was throwing monsters at them all the way through the book because he was enraged about the theft of his lightning bolt and because, well, you know, he's Zeus, he's a fucking idiot sometimes. He has a massive body count of people he got killed simply because he couldn't keep it in his fucking pants for five minutes. Athena is meant to be the smart one is what I'm getting at and I don't know, this just seems wildly out of character, at least to me. On the swing side, you could say that Echidna gets a bit of an upgrade. Like Uncle Ferdinand, she was originally more of a joke character than anything else, popping up out of nowhere on the arch, politely setting her chimera on Percy, then never showing up again. She's like a whole thing now, with the sinister monologues, the slow Terminator walk, and the Magneto powers. I wouldn't be surprised if she makes a return appearance later in the series. It would be off book, but it would be a shame if she didn't, to be honest. And in the minor detail corner. Between Electo trying to tempt Annabeth into giving up Percy so she would be unburdened by him on the quest, and Percy attempting to sacrifice himself to save the others on the arch, one can assume that the stipulation that if Percy dies, the quest dies, is absent in the show. Sadly, the show skips over the escaped pink poodle that Grover befriends, who beneficently agrees to return to its mildly disliked owners so the kids can use the reward money for train tickets. Oh, and uh, Percy's trip across the country was made a little more difficult in the book because he was wanted for crimes. Every monster-related event that mortals had semi-witnessed from his mother's disappearance to the bus crash was blamed on Percy in the newspapers and by Smelly Gabe. So, there were old school wanted posters of him cropping up all over the country. Final thoughts. It's starting to look like Riordan is treating this series less as a way to provide the super faithful adaptation we were hoping for after we were burned by the movies, and more of a chance to do a second draft of his story, updating it to account for what he saw as missed opportunities or things he later regretted. I say this because they're not adding a ton of completely original stuff, like one might expect to see if they were worried about having enough source material to fill out a whole series. In fact, as I mentioned, they're leaving a few things on the table so that clearly ain't it. Like I said at the start, they're holding to all of the book's plot beats. They're just different. You know, there's different takes on some of them. This is something I feel like I'm seeing more and more of when it's been a good amount of time since the original and the author is heavily involved in the project. And I, I'm just not sure how I feel about it. I, I don't mean this in a I know better than Raiden way, but the creator of something can often be the hardest on it. There's an anecdote within the art community about not letting an artist restore his own paintings because he'll end up repainting it completely. That said, it's an approach that definitely has some advantages. There's very few things that have zero room for improvement, and if anyone has the right to decide if something needs updating, it's the OG author. It comes with some element of risk though, because, well, the reason anything gets an adaptation is because lots of people really liked it, and if it's changed too much, even if it's still good, even if it's arguably better, it might not feel like that thing that people loved anymore, and that's always going to be on some level disappointing. I know I'm kind of fence-sitting, flip-flopping here, but uh, I mean, that's partly because I'm the king of pontification and partly because, like I said, I just, I can't decide how I feel. In my defense, overthinking things is my literal job. Perhaps all that really matters is I'm still enjoying watching the series. We'll see how things go, but I think that is enough for now. See you in the next episode, mortals. Don't forget to tip your metaphorical waitress by clicking that like button, and feel free to avail yourselves of these shortcuts to the first episode in the Percy Jackson saga, and where the next one will be when it's ready. Terrence out.